welcome to Fluoracy. Dr. Jim Timmons is a 1978 graduate of Ohio State University College of Optometry. He completed his hospital residency at the Chillicothe VA Medical Center, served as chief optometry service until 1985. In 89, he became chairman, Department of Clinical Sciences at the State University of New York College of Optometry. While at SUNY, he developed the Glaucoma Institute, a clinical research center, and served as its first director. In 2002, he co-founded Ophthalmic Consultants of Connecticut. Dr. Timmons has received numerous awards for his service to the profession and has over 200 publications in glaucoma, dry eye, cornea, and external disease, as well as refractive surgery and new technologies. He's a nationally and internationally acclaimed speaker and educator. He serves in professional appointments at several universities in the U.S. and has been a clinical investigator in over 20 NIH and NEI and post-release clinical trials. In 1999, he was awarded optometry's top educator and was selected as one of the top 10 clinicians of the decade. In 2002, he founded the National Glaucoma Society, an NFP with executive offices in Andover, Massachusetts, that provides educational and clinical development services to primary care clinicians worldwide in the area of glaucoma management. In 2005, he was inducted into the Optometry Hall of Fame and has recently served as president, Connecticut Association of Optometrists. Dr. Timmons was selected as the top eye doctor in Fairfield County in 2013. He currently serves as chief medical officer of Medical Optometry America, a new company which provides ODs an opportunity to partner and practice full scope medical optometry. Whew, welcome, Jim. That's a lot. Well, thank you, Alan. That was a very gracious introduction. <laughs> yeah, that's what the internet told me anyway. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad it thinks highly of me. That's good. You know, I was thinking about when we met, and uh, it was in the 90s when you were involved with bringing PLC to the U.S. from Canada, and I was trying to bring it to the D.C. area. Uh, that was an exciting time. You know what? It was. Uh, back. We actually just had an opportunity to kind of go back over that history. One of my students was asking about uh, TLC, and, you know, I was involved with the original 2020 Laser Group. That's how I think we met, and then uh, TLC eventually uh, acquired them and became the you know, the, the uh, iconic institution that it has been for the last 20 some years. So almost 30 years. Yeah. So it's been a, uh, it's been a great uh, opportunity for myself, but I think also for the profession to learn uh, about a space that really was new and innovative and has now become sort of de rigueur uh, relative to day-to-day -day care. I think it'd be hard for people to imagine what it was like before there was LASIK, but there actually was that time. So anyway, it was fun to be involved. So we've seen a few, disruptive technologies come along that was one of the most disruptive so it, and yet it only, it only penetrated you know what 10 percent of the market which is it's unfathomable to me if i i thought it was going to you know be a 50 60 percent or back then but yeah it's many years ago it's good good to see you again good to be talking to you, you. Too. um at some point along that line you you moved your focus or maybe it was just had been there the whole time to, to glaucoma what when did you choose glaucoma as your main area of focus so what happened was the, the facility here in Connecticut, I actually became uh, one of the uh, partners in the facility myself and a colleague named Dr. Eric Donenfeld, who I'm sure many of your listeners have heard of. Uh, Eric's one of the premier cornea people in America. So I was fortunate to merge with him and uh, we opened up our TLC center here. I became the executive director for probably about two and a half years. And during that time period, there was this constant request on the part of colleagues for us to take a look at a cornea or a patient who might have glaucoma or somebody with a retinal problem. And even though it was a laser center, we were serving as a referral center for other issues. And we finally sat down and said, look, let's just open our own facility. And I decided to become the uh, chief medical director at that facility. And we brought in somebody to take the TLC side. And now this practice is, is one of the largest, certainly the largest in the state, but maybe one of the larger ones in New England. So we've really been very fortunate. In that process back in the day, uh, before optometry was treating a lot of glaucoma, um, I just started to get a lot of referrals for glaucoma patients for consultative assessment. And I developed a real passion for it. And now the practice has blossomed into uh, probably about six or 700 personal glaucoma patients, uh, which is a, is a sizable volume. Yeah. And I, have a, I brought on a surgical glaucoma partner, Robin Hoyker, who's been fantastic to kind of add to that layer because you treat glaucoma long enough, it becomes a surgical disease in some capacity. So it's good. You know, we've had a really good run and uh, uh, glaucoma is exciting. But I have to tell you, I think other things are as exciting. Uh, some of the new technologies on the anterior segment side are amazing. 
and uh, in particular, uh, the new novel treatments for novel concepts of delivery, you know, sustained release, uh, intraocular, external, lacrimal contact lenses. Uh, that's very exciting to me. We're actually going to be involved in several clinical trials in that area. So, fantastic. We're going to we're going to dive into some new technologies today. So, I want to oh, I want to work our way there. I wanted to talk about the 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 big the the gorilla, the nine hundred pound gorilla in the glaucoma room is that we really don't understand still the cause of primary open angle glaucoma and we don't have a cure. Now, almost all therapies are aimed at reducing IOP, which seems to work in some cases. What has to happen to our understanding of the disease for us to be able to develop more successful and targeted therapies? So that's a really uh, important question. And I think it's one that has a lot of research that is currently behind it. But that research is, I guess for the best, best way to describe it, it's in its beginnings. Um, you know, I'm extremely excited about physiologic research in glaucoma, so cellular at the cellular physiologic level. Uh, the ability to identify mitochondrial disease, I think, is, is an exciting new potential opportunity in glaucoma because, you know, the cellular uh, health is basically built on mitochondrial activity. And it's been shown in some studies that the mitochondrial presence in glaucoma patients is notably less. And there probably is a time period where the mitochondria is affected and then slowly dies off as it does. It quits, quits supporting the cell and then we get glaucomatous loss that we identify as RNFL change, visual field change, uh, ganglion cell change. So I, I think the next step is the precursor to the anatomy and the, and the, and the uh, visual fields and to go to the cellular level and determine whether there's something we can do at that level to support cellular health as a as a barrier against progression, or even, you know, maybe universally down the road would be wonderful to have a uh, support system that would prevent people from developing glaucoma in, in the traditional way. So. And, and one of the, one of the controversies in that area I've, I've heard of, or I, I think is when you talk about the mitochondria, the cellular level, you're talking about oxidation and uh, neuroprotection a lot, but a lot of these might even be uh, vascular neuropathies, should, should researchers be pursuing treatments for vascular abnormalities and neuropathies alongside of neuroprotection and hypotensives? Yeah, look, I mean, there, there's this really interesting take on what glaucoma actually is. So, you know, we have type one diabetes, which is juvenile, right? And we know that that's an insulin-based process. We have type two diabetes, which is an inability to convert appropriate sugars and, and uh, interact with insulin. So we support that with drugs. Type three diabetes is actually fascinating because it's thought, and this, this is very fascinating because all of, all of the context around diabetes is that it's a degenerative disease based on insulin metabolism. Well, it turns out that in some current research, this is really interesting, they've looked at type three diabetes as possibly being Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Wow. Because it turns out that insulin levels in the brain are markedly altered in those patient bases for the most part, and they're inconsistent with normal levels. And it may be that it's an insulin uh, metabolism issue that's causing forward progression of the, of the uh, ganglion clusters that they have. So uh, the neurofibrillary tangles. Uh, type 4 diabetes, there's a fellow out of uh, South Asia who has proposed that type 4 diabetes is glaucoma because it also has this metabolic issue as brain tissue is affected, we have forward Wallerian progression of optic nerve damage, and maybe that's the issue. Other people, John Birdall being one of them, have proposed that it's actually intracranial pressure that changes over time. And as we age, the ICP, which is the driver for metabolic support to the nerve down the sheath, diminishes while the pressure in the eye goes up and he has devised a product, which is currently in clinical trial, that would actually lower the pressure at night to combat IOP rise without using a drug as a set of goggles. And the whole context there is that would increase the relative supply of axoplasmic flow from the brain. So there's a, there's a lot of different spaces that are being looked at at a uh, very high level research hmm. like uh, the CPAP perspective. For, kind of like a CPAP for the eyes. You have it. Yeah. That, that, the, well, actually, this all started with NASA because they found that uh, astronauts were developing papilledema because their cerebrospinal fluid pressure stayed constant, but the atmospheric pressure decreased. So the optic nerve would project forward because of axoplasmic pressure. Well, so they developed goggles to reverse that. And he went and 
said, let's just flip that polarity and take the pressure away. Well, just so. for our viewers' benefit, I want to tell you, you heard it here first, diabetes type 3, 4, and you know diabetes type 5 is what's going to happen to me tonight when I go out to dinner and have bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish, I wish I enjoyed bourbon. I just I just don't like it. It's not, it's not my drink of choice. It's so. not important whether you like it or not. We'll just have yeah. of course, some you can have you can, you can have mine. You can have mine. That's good. <laughs> So I, you had mentioned in the beginning diagnostics. I know that's something you love to talk about. And, and while therapies have been relatively static in advancement, a lot has, we've come a long way with improvements in, in diagnostics, improvements in OCT. Uh, a lot of them, I, I'm hearing people even saying that some of this has negated the need for disc photos. Where are you on that? And, and what technologies can you share with us today? So look, I mean, the, the standard platform that most everybody would agree to is uh, important. Obviously, visual fields still play a very critical role. Uh, OCTs have become, you know, the the Uber instrument in glaucoma, and for good reason. Uh, stereo photos are still really critical. I, I think people are probably moving away from those too quickly. Um, diagnostically, on the other side, there's a couple of issues. You know, corneal hysteresis has had a very major impact on clinicians' perspective about risk factors in disease. Madero's just published uh, last year, right around the beginning of COVID, a nice piece on patients who were glaucoma suspects. And traditionally, we'd use pachymetry to help identify high-risk behavior. But he showed that corneal hysteresis was even more sensitive than pachymetry to identify high-risk behavior in glaucoma suspects those who had low pachymetries had a much higher conversion rate to glaucoma over time versus those who had elevated PAC or uh, corneal hysteresis levels. Uh, the, the other really interesting piece about OCT is the algorithms have improved dramatically. So we're getting much better views, much better sort of overall clinical data uh, because we went from time domain to spectral domain. Now we have swept source. Um, you know, I teach, as you know, you mentioned earlier, kind enough to mention, I have a number of faculty appointments. And one of the things I love is bringing my new students in and literally tutoring them in the nuances of reading OCTs and glaucoma and other diseases. And, you know, they, get re they have a really good education when they come, but, you know, there's so many subtleties and variations and clinicians have become much more comfortable interpreting those subtleties and variations, much like we learned how to read visual fields away from tangent screens to the bowl and now to the Humphrey, the OCT is just developing. Ganglion cells had a big step forward. Uh, if your readers, if your listeners are interested, there's a piece by David Wong, H-W-A-N-G, uh, published in uh, uh, AJO back um, probably about 2017, I think it was. And it was just an epic article comparing the ability of visual fields versus OCTs in the early identification of the disease. And I think that article has done more to change my perspective than anything I've read because it clearly tells you that the preparametric, the early glaucoma this patient and the even early to moderate patient <clears throat> is far better identified and monitored with an OCT than they are with visual fields as a primary tool. Later in the disease, moderate to advanced moderate and then moderate to severe, visual fields become much more important because the OCT loses its sensitivity to, to uh, assess progression. So I think there's a lot of really interesting pieces there. A new technology that came out that I thought was fascinating when I got it and now has just embedded itself is a, a system that actually provides me with tonography, serial tonometry, and ophthalmodynamometry all in one instrument. It's called a FALC multi-system. Wow. And... Um, each of those takes about 10 seconds to acquire. Oh. And the tonography portion has just rocked my glaucoma world about what I didn't know about my patients who I was treating. So not only do I get you know, remarkable serial tonometries on people to understand diurnal variation, I can actually see outflow mechanics instantly based on, on a 10-second uh, assessment. Wow. So now what I'm doing is before I start treatment, I do a <clears throat> baseline, then after therapy, I go ahead and look at it again to see how successful the drug has been in increasing trabecular outflow mechanics. I'm doing it with all my surgical patients. My partner, Dr. Nowicker, uses it as well. So we put a scent in, we put a Zen, we do a hydrus. <clears throat> you measure pre and post, and Alan, you get these amazing differences. And the other factor is sometimes you don't get a difference at all, which tells you that the drug hasn't had any effect. And all you found was that you, you know, you'll see a patient go down in pressure, but the tonography stays the same. And that tells you that the you just found a little diurnal variation on the patient, but the actual drug had no net impact. Wow. 
Wow. So this is a whole new window of opportunity in glaucoma. So yeah, some very interesting mechanical advances. I is think. it on the market and how can people learn? It that? is. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's FDA approved. Okay. And unfortunately for the device, uh, as there were for many devices and products, it came out right when COVID hit. Oh. So it just kind of got lost in the COVID moment. Uh, I, I think uh, I think you'll start to see it surface again. But yeah, we were fortunate enough. I know a number of folks who have it as well. Yeah, if you think about it, connect me with them and we'll get them on the show to, to, to get the word. I will do that. Yeah, Frank Frank Falk is an incredibly uh, bright guy. He's the one inventor more, of One the more device. clinical question because I know your time's tight and then I want to get over to Medical Optometry America. Canaloplasty, now it has a, shown a low rate of complications, especially compared with the gold standard, trabecula, trabeculotomy, Trabs yep. being the gold standard, how's the landscape for these surgical tubes, trabs, canaloplasty looking and going to play out in the next five years? So from a clinical perspective, you know, our practice is, you know, we're very fortunate. We have a huge referral base of clinicians, much like the, you know, your, the work that you did in Maryland. And um, as a result of that, we have a robust surgical platform that we work from. So we provide uh, at least 10 different surgical interventions away from tubes. So Ahmed valves, that kind of thing. So we do stents. We do uh, hydras, we do omnis, we do canaloplasties, we do trabectomes, we do uh, cohook blades, uh, we do zens, we do express mini shunts. All of those are levels of um, development, I guess would be the best way to put it, that as far as treatment of the glaucoma patient that are like nothing we've had before because it used to be that we would start drugs, then we would do a little laser if the drugs didn't work. When the laser failed, we'd do more drugs. And then eventually we skipped from that right to trabeculectomy. So what this has done is this, this whole MIGS, microinvasive glaucoma surgery, what it's done is it's created this massive space between first therapy and trabeculectomy for which you can very selectively tailor the approach to every patient. So, and I, I literally tell every patient now, given the success of those procedures, Every patient I see that I start, and even patients I've been treating for a while, I just give them a little, little opening presentation that says, look, you have glaucoma, you're going to live a very long time. And during that time, we're going to use both medicine and surgery to control your pressure. Right now, we're doing really well with medicine. At some point, the medicine may not work as well. We're going to need to do a little procedure. It starts with lasers, and we have a number of other things we can select that will help you contain your glaucoma and keep good vision forever. And when you prep a patient like that, when you need to go to the next level, they're like, oh yeah, we talked about that. That's fine, let's go. Uh, I think the day and age of managing patients with just topical therapy is probably not gonna stay long. There's just too many other options coming up, so. Right, it's too important. Yeah. It All is. Right. Yeah. Tell us about your huge project. Uh, we've talked about it, but I'm gonna just open up the conversation for you to let our, our viewers know about Medical Optometry American, what, what you're bringing to the table through that organization. Okay. Yeah, well, thanks for that intro. That This is actually my new passion, right? I mean, I have a lot of things I've done in my life. This is, I've been blessed to be able to sort of see some things that, see areas of optometry that we're developing and, and be able to participate. And each of those is sort of layered up to the next level. But one of the pieces that became evident a few years back, actually, you know, you and I have talked about this quite a bit, is that the traditional optometry uh, concept of delivering uh, optical refractive services has begun to become challenged by outside forces. Uh, there are both online forces in the contact lens space, which have actually succeeded uh, pretty, pretty pleasantly over the last several years and have a lot of money behind them. Uh, the refractive space from a spectacle perspective, I think a lot of people thought wouldn't happen, but that's also being challenged. We have companies that can actually start to do refractions now on cell phones. We have companies that provide remote refractive services with licensed doctors from other states. So there's lots of players coming in from the outside. And, you know, if you look at the overall growth in that market, and if you look at the IBIS reports, and for your, for your listeners, IBIS is the international business report that literally reviews every profession every six months. And if you read those, uh, they're hard to get to because they're quite a pricey, but all the Wall Street folks have them. My son's a banker, so I get to share in that. Um, he shows them to me. Um, there's no growth on the optical side over the last five years. It's been flat. In the medical side, the growth has been anywhere from 7 to 10 or 11% per year. 
Wow. And so if you take those numbers and you look at where that is and you look at where medical growth is, it's very clear that the way to grow the practice is to not expect that you're going to make an inif- a significant increase in profit on that side, but instead look how we can expand the medical base. So I was fortunate enough to meet with a really bright entrepreneur, a gentleman named Ken Krieg, uh, through the PRN uh, world. The PRN is a nutraceutical company that he founded and very, very successfully uh, husbanded to a really remarkable level. Uh, he's also done a number of other venture startups in healthcare. Uh, there's a great team there. <clears throat> we met several years ago. We started talking about it. And we came up with the concept that, you know, for those optometrists who see the future in the way that we do, and I do believe that the vast majority of private practitioners do see that as, as one of the things that they understand they have to do, uh, we wanted to be the company that would help them be able to transition their current practice into a full-fledged medical eye care facility, which would allow them to become, you know, in my parlance, my terms, the internal medicine of eye care. I let ophthalmology be the invasive cardiovascular surgeons and really carve off that space in a formal way so that medicine in general, general medicine, internal medicine, rheumatology, neurology, they look at that level of input or access as the primary way, as a primary source of referral. I mean, if you look at the number of ophthalmologists being produced, it's flat. Uh, Rich Edlow, who you know exceptionally well, uh, Rich is an amazing uh, arbiter of the economics of eye care. He's, he's really one of the more interesting people I've ever listened to. Uh, and I love listening to him. And I just heard a presentation by him and what I knew he confirmed in numbers, ophthalmology is flat and it's not gonna go up for the next 10 years. The number of surgical cases is, has will triple in that next 10 years. And yet the, and the number of increased case load medical eye care visits is going up 16 million a year during that time period. So we have these marked trend lines and the, pract- you know, the, the, the profession to fill them is optometry. You know, it's a very direct connection. And if we accept that role, I think we can actually considerably move the profession to a next level. You know, we started off, my career has been, uh, it's been 40 years. I graduated 40 years ago. No, is that right? Yeah, it's about 40. Uh, so when I started, uh, most of the states didn't have diagnostics. Most of this, none of the states, very few of the states had therapeutics, North Carolina and West Virginia. So I've watched the profession grow through that phase. I've watched us grow through a really improved clinical training program at the university level. I've watched us evolve into, you know, true professional providers of eye health care. And then I've also had the pleasure of working and testifying and, you know, doing other things relative to states advancing their legislative agendas. We've moved into lasers, we've moved into anterior segment surgery. So the profession has naturally walked forward. The one piece that's sort of been left behind is it's been left up to individuals to kind of craft that moment to moment. This MOA concept allows somebody to join the organization and to use all the resources that we've developed to assist them in becoming that provider in their community that most people either aren't prepared for, don't have the time for, or maybe don't have the the financial resources to extend. But this allows them to have a um, proven and well-developed relationship that's going to allow them to move that medical side forward. And I think that's really important. Boil that down for a second. So there's a doc out there, they want to open a practice, they're medical focused. They've been looking at their options. They have a lot of debt. What, how do they, how does it, what, what's the process from start to finish to becoming a, a, a medical optometry America doctor? So at this point we have opened our, we're opening our second and we have a third, uh, we have a fourth facility that we've opened and we've used those as beta sites to demonstrate how this model can produce an affected outcome or a very effective outcome. And the first site has done so well, it's just, it was so far beyond expectations that we've just ramped up the, the placement of second, third and fourth sites. And those are sort of uh, company-based programs. They involve optometry practices like some, like the one you used to have. They involve de novo centers and uh, they're sort of hybrid models and they're a mixture, which is all useful because it will help us understand a lot of different markets. But this would be something that will be available to clinicians in 2022. Uh, maybe, yeah, probably 2022, I would imagine by then. And we'll be able to provide them with that platform. They want to move into the medical side. We would join them. We would help them understand what that uh, looks like. 
Uh, we don't buy practices. This is not a private equity situation. We want the doctor who grew the practice to benefit from that growth and to be successful over time. Uh, they've obviously done a great, a great job. That's how they got there. You know, I don't need to do that. And you know, Vision Source was a model that took a percent of everything. This is not that either. This is a model that takes a percent of the growth on the medical side to allow you to continue to, uh, are you there? I got a little battery issue here. To allow you continue to, to allow you continue to grow and do all the things you've done well, but to focus that growth in the medical side of your practice. That's fantastic. What we'll do is we'll have you back once you've gone through the phases. Of, I think that, uh, that, that would be health. great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but as I said, our first practice was, you know, we opened it in January of this year, uh, during the middle of the winter, during the dead center of the COVID storm, and in a smaller town in Southern Pennsylvania. And the numbers in that practice are so extraordinary that uh, I feel like I need to work harder to kind of keep up with them because, you know, in six months, revenue streams have gotten up into the projected, uh, you know, probably in that half million dollar a year range in a six month level. I mean, that's an amazing amount of medical eye work in a six month period. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. So services that help with, with billing and, and coding. And that's, that's the thing. All that of that is, all of that is part of our system. Yes, that's exactly. Doctors need. So that's great. Let's, uh, I know you got to, you don't have too much longer. Uh, one quick question. Let's give a plug and tell us a little bit about the optometric glaucoma society you founded and, and how that drives. Oh, thank you. you. All right. So the national glaucoma society is the, uh, yeah, well, there's two, there's optometric glaucoma society. I'm a founding member of that as well. National Glaucoma Society was my perspective because, you know, OGS is a group of really super smart and very talented clinicians, but it's, it's a small catcher. It's a small house. Um, I felt that, you know, if optometry was going to take on glaucoma, we needed to have an organization that embraced the private practitioner who really was the end point of all of this. So we started the NGS, as you said, back in about 2003, I think it was. And, uh, we're now up to about 3,500 members. We're based out of Massachusetts. We offer two major meetings. We have an East Coast uh, National Glaucoma Society meeting on Cape Cod. We have a West Coast meeting in Orange County. Uh, and this year we did 42 virtual meetings to meet the needs of our members because nobody was live. Uh, by the way, just as a plug to my, my two partners, one of whom is an optometrist, the other whom has an advanced degree in professional education. Um, when everything went south for the schools when COVID came, I went to them and said, look, you know, we, we have this amazing archive of remarkable doctors who have lectured for us. We record everything. It's in our, you know, if you're a member, you have access to the, uh, to the vault anytime you want. Uh, I said, let's put together a package for the schools and for the VA residents. And both of them took that with you know, great fervor and used it extensively in their training because the, the faculty just had, you know, they were teaching a regular class and the next day they were shut down. So we were able to give them 25 hours of outstanding CE that they could use to help sort of bolster what they were doing. And we just got great feedback from that. So the organizations that are to serve the profession, we're not for profit. So none of us get a salary. We just enjoy what we do. And uh, uh, we will soon be the largest organization in optometry next to AOA. Wow. What's the, yeah. uh, what's the website? Where can people learn more? Uh, NationalGlaucomaSociety.org. Okay, great. Great. That's Please all. feel free to come join us. So in wrapping up, first, tell us about your family. Well, uh, great news. Uh, I actually got to see my daughter, my youngest daughter, for the first time in 16 months. She oh. came home for a wedding uh, bridal shower thing, and she ended up staying the week. So she just left this morning. And uh, that was probably the nicest thing that's happened to me in a very long time. Wow. I also got to see my grandkids and uh, my son in Charlotte, uh, down at Euron Woods, about a month ago. So the world's opening back up, and life has been uh, lovely. So. That's great. Uh, the kids. Yeah. How about your family? Everybody good? Everybody's great. Yeah. They're, the kids are, uh, it was rough. They, they, they bore the brunt. The high school kids bore the brunt of this. And it's nice to see him branching out again and getting out into the world and starting to forget about things. Just sent, uh, sent my youngest off to camp. He, he just graduated high school. Oh, congrats. That's his happy place. He's a counselor, but he wasn't going to go, but let's we just wanted to get him out of Dodge, you know? It, it you know what? I think I think it's fantastic that that kids are being brought back into the world. I have so many teachers as patients. You know, my dry eye populations. So it's a fair number of teachers. Um, it was a rough year for them. It was a tough year for everybody in America. And I'm glad to be on the other side of it. But, you know, kudos to them for having gotten through it, and kudos to the kids for having gotten through it. That's it's going to be an interesting story to listen to as they get a little older and they tell the tale of their COVID life. 
Interesting. Uh, when they were 13. Yeah. Or forget. Yeah. Oh, there, there you go. There you go. All <laughs> right. right so now, Alan, listen, I, thank you for it. taking time out of your super busy day. I know you got probably have a patient in the chair right now who's dilating. And I, I actually, do. To watch I actually do. Where is Dr. Timmons right now? <laughs> uh, I I, I'm sure that's that. been said a few times, but that's okay. I hope right. they don't see this video <laughs> because then they'll know. Uh, there anyhow, you go. <laughs> listen, great talking to you. And we will have you back to catch up. And, and listen, love I, to catch up later. Appreciate everything you bring to the profession and, and to my professional life as well. And, and look forward to talking soon.